This micro lecture is on the twin block appliance which is a myofunctional appliance, a removable myofunctional appliance. So in this micro lecture we are going to be looking at everything starting from how the twin block appliance was developed, the mechanism of action, how the appliance looks, what are the features, design features, what are the phases of twin block therapy, something called as the pterygoid response etc. So to begin with, what is a twin block appliance? A twin block appliance is nothing but a removable myofunctional appliance. Now these are designed to be simple bite blocks. You have an upper bite block and a lower bite block that is not joined with one another. Now both of these bite blocks have occlusal inclined planes that interlock at a particular angulation when the mandible is postured in a forward position. So the simple bite blocks that are given are designed to be worn for 24 hours a day. So this brings about a rapid functional correction of a skeletal class 2 malocclusion by basically transferring or transmitting these occlusal forces to the occlusal inclined plane that covers all the posterior teeth. Now how did the twin block appliance come up or how did it come into being? It was developed by Professor William J. Clark in the year 1977. and it was developed as a response to a clinical problem. So basically what had happened was that a young eight-year-old patient of a dental colleague had fallen down and he had a luxated upper central incisor. Along with this, he also had a class 2 div 1 type of malocclusion with an overjet of 9 mm. Now after six months, it was observed that this luxated tooth that was reattached was only partially reattached with severe root resorption. Now in order to prevent this, an upper inclined plane was given to posture the mandible forward and it was worn full time. And at that time no such appliances were even available. Now to Professor Clark's surprise in 9 months he found that the overjet had considerably reduced as it shown in the documented case which was actually the first case of twin block that was documented by Professor Clark. It was also found that the incisor was stabilized and this upper fixed appliance was used then to complete the entire treatment. So let's look at how the twin block appliance actually works. It works on the principle or mechanism or the philosophy of the occlusal inclined plane. So basically, if you look at the top picture, the left hand side, you see that the occlusal inclined plane is the fundamental mechanism of any dentition. That is, the cuspal inclines play an important role in determining the relationship of the teeth. Now if the mandible closes in a distal relationship to the maxilla, that is it is present backwards in distal occlusion or in class 2 occlusion, then the forces, the occlusal forces that are acting on the mandible in normal function will have a distal component of force. So this distal component of force will continue to keep the mandible locked in a distal position. So there is an unfavorable cuspal incline that keeps the mandible locked in a distal position and doesn't allow it to grow forward. So in such cases when you give a twin block appliance, it's constructed in a protrusive bite. That is the mandible is protruded forward and this effectively modifies the occlusal inclined plane by means of these bite blocks. So when these bite blocks are present in the twin block appliance, they act as a guiding mechanism causing the mandible to be uh, you know, displaced downward and forward. So what happens when the mandible is displaced downward as well as forward? The cuspal contacts that were unfavorable and kept the mandible locked in a distal occlusion is replaced by favorable proprioceptive contacts and it frees the mandible from its locked position and gets the mandible forward. So this is the principle of occlusal inclined plane based on which the twin block appliance works. So, so far what we learnt was that the twin block appliance consists of two simple bite blocks which have occlusal inclined plane that are interlocking with each other at a particular angulation and this happens uh, when the mandible is postured in a forward position. Now in order to design an appliance like this we need to take a construction bite. Now how do we register this bite? It is registered with the help of wax using certain gauges. You have two gauges as far as the twin block appliance bite registration is concerned. In the first one is the exacto bite or the project bite which is shown in this slide. Now this is used to record the protrusive interocclusal record for the twin block construction. That is the mandible is positioned forward or postured forward at particular millimeter which is the sagittal activation. So if you observe the uh, project bite they come in different colors and they also have certain grooves which tells us how much mm or how many millimeters the mandible is advanced forward. So this is the sagittal activation and the vertical activation 
uh, is denoted by the color. Now, if you see the blue color, it gives about 3 mm of interincisal clearance. So, the exacto byte or the project byte is helping us to record the protrusive interocclusal record for the twin block construction. So, this is the first gauge that's being used. As we saw in the previous slide, we were talking about the registration or the byte registration for a twin block appliance. The first gauge that we used was the exacto byte or the project byte. In this project byte or uh, exacto byte was used to determine a particular sagittal advancement and vertical opening for the twin block appliance. Now, since it's a protrusive uh, record, it is important that this is done within a physiologic range. Now, if the protrusive record is too much, if you do it beyond a particular threshold value, you can the patient can start developing temporomandibular joint problems. So, the normal uh, protrusive bite re uh, record that is taken for a twin block appliance should not be more than 70% of the total joint displacement. Now, in order to measure the protrusive path of the mandible and determine how much activation is registered in this uh, construction byte, you use a George byte gauge which has a millimeter gauge to ascertain how much is the protrusive record so that the patient doesn't develop any joint issues, TMJ problems. Another concept that we have to talk about when we are talking about the twin block byte registration is the concept of the comfort zone. Now when we get or when we advance the mandible in a forward position and take a particular byte, you also have to establish that a correct vertical dimension is being uh, maintained during the twin block treatment. So for this, there is something called as the comfort zone, which is the intergingival height, which is measured from the gingival margin of the upper incisor to the gingival margin of the lower incisor when the teeth are in occlusion. So in adults, these, this value, this normal value is between 17 to 19 mm and children, it is between 15 to 17 mm. So what is the comfort zone? It is the height of the upper incisor plus the height of the lower incisor minus the normal overbite. So this should be 17 to 19 millimeter in adults, 15 to 17 millimeter in children and this is called as the comfort zone and these values are very important. If you have a twin block uh, appliance with a bite which is exceeding this comfort zone, then the patient can be uh, at a risk for developing TMJ problems. So how does the twin block appliance actually look or you know, what are the design features? Now if you look at the picture above, you see that the twin block appliance have two separate uh, blocks which is the upper block as well as the lower block. Now these have a occlusal inclined plane that interlock at a particular angulation with each other. You also have the uh, wire component which is the labial bone, the Adams clasp and in the anteriors of the lower you also see certain ball and clasps. Now if the lower incisors are already proclined, you give an incisal capping in the acrylic portion on the lower incisors. Now if you look at the uh, upper bite block, you see that it is angled from the mesial surface of the second uh, premolar or the deciduous molar, whichever is present. The lower bite block does not extend distally to the marginal ridge on the lower second premolar. So what this does, it helps to keep the leading edge of the inclined plane on the upper uh, appliance to be positioned mesial to the lower first molar so as not to obstruct any eruption. So basically all that you have to remember is that you have an upper bite block, lower bite block which is extending from the base plate that are uh, interlocking at a particular angulation with each other and you have certain wire component. Now, as far as the retentive uh, wire components of the uh, uh, twin block appliance is concerned, in the original design when we saw the picture, it was an Adams clasp. Eventually, this Adams clasp was replaced by what is known as the Delta clasp, which was also developed by Professor Clark. Now, what was different with a Delta clasp? If you look at it closely, it looks very similar to an Adams clasp with the fact that it has a bridge which is angulated uh, to the tooth and the way it is seated in the undercuts. It's all very similar to an Adams clasp. The only difference is in the retentive loops. That is the retentive loops where it's sitting in the undercut. In a uh, Adams clasp, it was basically like an arrowhead in shape. But here, the retentive loops are closed triangle in shape or a delta. And eventually this was replaced by the circular shape which is more popular in order uh, to make it more convenient in design. Now what are the advantages of this delta clasp over uh, the regular Adams clasp that was used? There was improved retention compared to the Adams clasp. There was reduced metal fatigue. Now you know that with Adams clasp, in the million dollar bend that is given, 
that is where there is more uh, breakage or that is the common point of fracture now there was reduced metal fatigue or this problem was overcome in the delta clasp and also there was a minimal need for adjustments these are the important advantages of the delta clasp over the adams clasp now as far as the twin block appliance is concerned we have been speaking about that there are two simple bite blocks that have a clusal inclined plane that interlock or occlude at a particular angulation so we are going to be talking about the angulation of these uh, twin blocks now uh, you know they went underwent a series of changes as to what was this angulation and which was most ideal initially the angulation between the upper and the lower twin block was at 90 degrees now what happened at 90 degree was that it was difficult for the patient to maintain it in a forward position and the patient could easily revert back to the old distal position so they thought let's change the angulation and make it 45 degree to overcome this problem and they used this 45 degree for a, a successful eight year period where it applied an equal downward as well as a forward force to the mandible and guided it forward they eventually changed it to a 70 degree angulation which is what is most popularly used until now now why is the 70 degree more important or why is the 70 degree so important or an ideal angulation is that it applies a more horizontal component of force now how does it do this this is by the concept of forward reflex posturing now the 70 degree angulation can maintain the uh, twin block or the mouth or the patient's mouth in an artificial forward bite of accommodation now it can be uh, easily uh, positioning the mandible at in a forward position both at rest as well as function that was the speciality of the 70 degree it applied a more horizontal component of force and it helped the patient maintain the mandible in a continuous forward posture both at rest as well as function now what is the reason for this easiness or you know this effortless forward positioning both at rest as well as in function was because it mimicked or simulated the hinge axis opening to the occlusal plane the hinge axis opening of the mandible or condyle is approximately at 70 degree to the occlusal plane and since the 70 degree angulation mimics this natural angulation that the hinge axis makes to the occlusal plane it could allow for 24 hour forward posturing when the masticatory system was both at rest as well as in function and that is why the 70 degree angulation is being used let's now consider the trimming of the twin block appliance now the trimming of the twin block appliance is done in a sequential and a gradual manner and in specified millimeters every particular visit you start trimming the upper bite block occluso distally if you see it is trimmed in an occlusal direction as well as distal direction to encourage the eruption of the lower molars which is denoted by the arrow marks and this is done gradually over a period of several months and this is done until the molars begin to be in occlusion so eventually you keep trimming the acrylic in a gradual way such that the uh, lower molar erupts and comes into occlusion now once the lower molars and the upper molars are in complete occlusion you trim the bite blocks or the twin block gradually in the premolar region as well so that you allow them to erupt into occlusion there are three phases or three stages to the twin block uh, treatment uh, approach you have the active phase you have the support phase and you have the retention phase so the active phase is for about six to nine months the support phase is for about four to six months and the retention phase is for about nine months so this is the uh, three these are the three phases so what is the aim of the active phase the aim of the active phase is to correct the surgical jaw position from a class 2 relation it's got to a class 1 relationship the overjet the overbite and the sagittal relationship is fully corrected basically using a three point contact with the incisors and the molars so for the active phase is carried for about carried out for about 6 to 9 months where the entire sagittal relationship is corrected so next you have the support phase which is for about four to six months and the aim of this is to maintain the corrected incisor position until the buccal relationship that is you will have a slight posterior open bite because of the appliance until this buccal interdigitation is fully interdigitated the support phase is continued so what appliance is given during the support phase the twin block is removed and an upper anterior uh, upper hollies appliance within anterior inclined plane is given with a labial bow to engage the lower incisors and the canines 
Now next you have the retention phase once the support phase is over. Here the treatment is followed by retention with an upper anterior inclined plane appliance. But what is different is that the appliance wear is reduced only to night time once the occlusion is fully established. So if you look at this picture you can see that an upper anterior inclined plane is given. Now in the support phase this upper anterior inclined plane maintains the uh, jaw in the corrected sagittal position and you are giving an upper anterior inclined plane such that all the teeth which need to interdigitate will extrude or erupt to achieve a proper occlusion. So in the retention phase the same upper anterior inclined plane is continued but there is full interdigitation as you can see on the top hand right picture where the uh, lower teeth have completely erupted and a full interdigitation is uh, accomplished. So we come to the last part of the micro lecture where uh, we discuss about an important concept which is known as the uh, pterygoid response which is seen after the use of twin block. Now this concept of pterygoid response uh, was given by Professor McNamara. Now when a functional appliance like a twin block is placed in the mouth, the mandible you know is guided into a more forward position. Now when this happens there is a new pattern of muzzle behavior which is established quickly. So in this patient after a particular time the patient finds it practically impossible or difficult to retract the mandible to its to his or her old position. So this causes a sense of uh, for the patient to wear the appliance rather than leave it out. Now this change in this muzzle activity was described by McNamara as the pterygoid response. Now why does this pterygoid response happen? It's because of an altered activity of the medial head of the lateral pterygoid muscle in response to this mandibular protrusion. So what is the mechanism of this pterygoid response? So once there is the placement of the twin block appliance, there's an initial response where the functional mandibular protrusion brings about a change in the muscle, uh, muscles of mastication to establish a new equilibrium in the muscle uh, behavior. So what happens is that there is volumetric changes in the mandibular condyle region where there are more cellular proliferation, the more, there are more cells that are coming there. So this leads to an altered muscle function causing a proprioceptive sensory mechanism to initiate a bony remodeling. Now because there is a cellular proliferation or increase in the number of cells, this causes a proprioceptive uh, sensory mechanism to initiate a bony remodeling. So in that region there is bony remodeling as well. Now because of the overgrowth of blood vessels and connective tissue just behind the condyle at the retrodiscal tissue area, when the patient tries to bring the mandible to the original position, what happens is that it compresses on the connective tissue and the blood vessels and the patient experiences severe pain or discomfort when he tries to do that. And that pain or discomfort is known as the pterygoid response. Now this was also called as the tension zone by Harvard which was present distal to the condyle. This is known as the pterygoid response or the tension zone by Harvold which is seen roughly at about 6 to 8 weeks after appliance wear. This is also a useful indicator to check if the patient has been wearing the appliance or not. So in this micro lecture we saw briefly about the twin block appliance, all the points that you needed to know to answer your MCQs right from the history of the twin block appliance to the principle or the philosophy of the twin block appliance which was the occlusal inclined plane where you saw that the uh, inclined planes in a class 2 relationship held the mandible in a locked position distally. So when a twin block was given it relieved this locking, it unlocked the mandible to help grow the mandible in a downward and forward direction. Then we saw the design of the twin blocks, the angulation, why a 70 degree angulation was important. We saw how the bite registration was done, what are the gauges that were used for the bite registration of the twin block, how much should be the sagittal advancement, how do you manage the vertical dimension, that is how you should not encroach upon the comfort zone. And then you also, we also spoke about the uh, phases of twin block therapy, what is done at each phase. Then in the end we did discuss about the pterygoid response or the tension zone which was given by Harvold. Now at the end of the micro lecture you should be able to get an answer to all of these questions that have been put in forward, uh, put in front of you. Uh, so hopefully the concepts are clear and uh, you should be able to answer either a picture based question or MCQ which is based on the twin block appliance. So thank you.